Well, hi there, Mr. Bleeker again. Well, I'm kind of excited. eCampus Live Biology moves into the second half of the course, which focuses on human body systems. So we'll start out today with an overview of them, and I'll also discuss this thing called homeostasis. Now, you've probably heard of it before, but it's how our body systems interact to ensure our survival, how they work together. And we talk a little bit about how when they don't interact, um, that can result in various disorders, diseases uh, that can make us sick. Um, some are even fatal. But I'll tell you what, let's get going with just sort of an overview. There, on the course site, there's some tremendous stuff I want you to take a look at. In particular, these videos and animations here. And there's a, you can have a lot of fun with these down here. These are some neat flash animations. If you've ever played the game Operation, you want to click on that one. Okay? But I digress. Let's get started because we have a lot to chat about today. Okay. So the human body systems. Generally, what we need to, to start with is how the human body is organized, really from its smallest pieces of Lego right up to the construct. Well, sort of if you begin at the smallest subunit, you can think of the human body of being composed of cells. Now, if you've ever heard about the cell theory, that's just a theory that says all living things are created from cells, cells are the basis of life, and cells beget cells. In other words, cells give rise to other cells. Good way to visualize this is to draw sort of an up down or upside down triangle and put in a few divisions like this. Kind of looks like the food pyramid turned upside down. And where we'll place cells on here is we'll say cells form the foundation. So that's the most general or broadest level. Now, when cells come together, uh, what you get are tissues. Interestingly enough, a lot of people don't realize that blood itself is a collection of tissues. Um, blood is actually a connective tissue. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the uh, circulatory system unit. But if you get groups of cells, layers of, of cells, then what you get are tissues. So the construct becomes larger. Now as you're forming, think of a, we go back far enough when you were a zygote, your cells divided and divided and divided until we got enough different types of cells that we could form tissues. And really early on, uh, the most important of the tissues is the heart. And it'll, it's one of the very first things that has to form uh, so that the organism can develop. You need a nutrient and, and um, oxygen and carbon dioxide transfer system. So as those tissues first formed, um, they build up and they build on each other until you get organs. Your heart is a great example of that. So organs fall to this level. And we've got many organs. You, there's your stomach, your heart, your brain, uh, in your spinal column, your kidneys. These organs occupy um, sort of they're the resident occupants of different systems. So what we say is because you have different body systems, circulatory, respiratory, etc., we say that the organs start to move into camps where we get organ systems. So I'll just denote it like that. But you notice I left an extra little spot at the bottom. Here's the reason. All of these things make you or critters on our planet, it makes an organism. That's the reason why we use that term. An organism is composed of organ systems that are made up of organs. Organs are created by the growth of tissues and tissues wouldn't come together if they weren't composed of cells. So there you go. There's a nice broad overview of what a multicellular organism is composed of. Now you notice we said multicellular. Okay, we're if, if you think about protists that we studied in grade 11, right, they don't do this. They don't have cells and tissues and organs. That's because, by definition, protists are largely unicellular. So we are looking at the multicellular level. So every cell in the body is an independent unit. So 
should highlight that. That's kind of important, right? But even though um, it's independent, it's also dependent on other cells. Here's a good example. If you think about cells of the respiratory system, they have a pretty important job of bringing oxygen to our tissue. So you can think of the respiratory system, the cells of your lungs, as interacting with the circulatory system, which I'll just denote this way, right? Which is really for transport. And you could see how that handoff would be really important. Respiratory system brings in the oxygen, the circulatory system transports it, and vice versa. Circulatory system will give carbon dioxide for the respiratory system to remove from the body. So just a quick interdependence sort of example. It's kind of why your lungs and heart are so darn close to each other. But cells are the basic structure. Think of cells as the fundamental Lego of life. Right, draw a little nucleus in here, nucleolus. Right? But what's different about multicellular organisms is that these cells, even though we think of it, we start as just a, a zygote, but as that zygote divides and we get all sorts of different cells, the cells specialize. Respiratory, circulatory, reproductive, right, excretory, nervous, and I mean that's just to name a few. I haven't even gone on into the endocrine system which is um, focuses on your hormones. But at the tissue level if you bring enough cells together you can get tissue. And sometimes it, that's a little bit hard for people to picture, but if you think about tissues like um, bones, a couple ones that if you think of your connective tissues, for example, your ligaments, think of your tendons, um, epithelial tissue, right, which is mentioned here. Now when I say that I'd be referring to things like skin, right? There's four basic kind of tissues that you should know about. We'll chat a little bit about these because this is what you are made up of. These four basic tissues. Okay, so just one moment. All right, let's leave here for a second. And I want to show you the four basic tissues. Okay. Because if it wasn't for these four basic tissue types, um, we wouldn't have all the different uh, tissues that form in our body. So we'll go to images and there's a good good fundamental example. Okay, if we focus in on connective tissue, right, you could think of connective, ones that will come to mind for connective tissue will be things like ligaments, like tendons, and connective tissue does exactly what it says. It's connective, it's supportive. Your blood is a connective tissue. Epithelial tissue well, you, you can put your skin into this category. These tissues form linings. So if you take your finger and touch the inside of your mouth, that's a specialized kind of epithelial tissue. In fact, the epithelial tissue that lines your mouth goes through several changes, but as it goes through your body, you have a, a digestive tube that starts at the mouth and ends at the anus. And that lining is epithelial tissue. Now there's several types of epithelial tissue, but right here we're just going to mention what the, the purpose is. Another type of tissue that you can't live without is muscle. Now there's several types of muscular tissue. You've got skeletal muscle, right, which you use to move. That's voluntary. It's very striated. You also have cardiac muscle, 
Now that's involuntary and it's kind of striated too, but it's, it does exactly what it says it does. It's cardiac tissue and it keeps your heart beating. Uh, the third, sorry, the third type of tissue is smooth muscle. Now I often make a joke and, and say it's, it's a good thing that we don't have to think about a lot of these processes or, or heaven forbid we wouldn't survive. We don't think about telling our digestive system to contract, to push food through our bodies. That's a kind of smooth muscle, and that has nothing to do with conscious control. But as it sort of squishes and cramps and pushes things along, uh, food begins, as it enters the stomach, is just pushed through your digestive system. So we have smooth muscle. And the last tissue that we can't live without is nervous tissue. And this is the, you can think of this as the cabling system. All these specialized nerve cells run our muscles and they run our glands. They help us think. Kind of all of the above. And that's just the four basic tissue types. Okay. So here we go. So here's the, here's the specifics on the tissue types, right? Epithelial. It's important to think of epithelial as a covering, right? It's sort of thought of as, as a covering that will go throughout the body and you'll find it on the outside of the body. Covers our glands and our tissues. Connective tissues is on the other hand, I'm going to switch this from green because I've been using green too much. So let's make that yellow. There we go. So connective tissue supports the body, connects the body parts. Um, so bones, ligaments, tendons, blood, they all fall into this category. So think of the connection, okay, because that's the most important part, right? So your skeleton falls into this category. Right? There's your switch back now. Nervous tissue moving these impulses around the body. But it is very important that you understand that nervous tissue right, is communicative, but our nervous tissue can tell our glands, oops, and our muscles what to do. I mean, your heart beats, and that is under nervous control. If you feel the back of your skull there, you'll find your medulla oblongata. That's what's controlling your breathing. That's what's controlling your heart rate. That's why um, a lot of predators, like certain big cats, right, like to bite into the, the back of the neck because they'll, they'll pierce the medulla oblongata and they sever the connection between the brain and the heart and the lungs and that results in the death of the organism. Now for muscle tissue, remember that you've got three forms. So I'll just make a quick note. You've got skeletal. you've got cardiac and you have smooth. This one is the only one that's truly voluntary. Some athletes can slow down the function of their heart, but it, literally you can't stop the heart from beating. So these ones are largely involuntary. Okay. So as we move up the pyramid, as we start to head towards the peak, we look at organs and organ systems. Now, as it denotes here, there's 11 organ systems in the body. So it becomes a challenge for any course to go through all of them. You can imagine, right? So we begin with our first one. So the nervous system, um, if you've taken any uh, psychology, it's a popular course at the school, right? No, it's a popular course anywhere. You have a couple of uh, structures here you have to look at. Now, without getting into too much detail, just a second here, I'll pull that down. You have what's called uh, your central nervous system. So I'll just kind of outline it here. You got your central nervous system right here, which is your brain and spinal cord. And then you'll notice 
the peripheral nerves, all these going off every which way, carrying messages all the way down to your toes, that's called your peripheral nervous system. Now peripheral means edge, so the signal literally goes from the center out to the edges, which is why they call those peripheral nerves. So the nervous system is the boss. It coordinates the body's responses to all sorts of things. If you've ever been in a car crash, for example, your central nervous system can largely take over, hypercharge your sensitivity, um, your ability to see, slow down your concept of time. Uh, it's pretty interesting. It's like it's like all the powers of the amazing Spider-Man because you can sense things happening um, so in such amazing detail. And that has a lot to do with adrenaline, but it's a function of your central nervous system. It becomes quite heightened during times of extreme distress. Another system is your integumentary system. So what are we talking about here? Well, that just refers to your skin and all the stuff that goes with it. Skin, your hair, your nails, your sweat, and your oil glands. Now, the oil that you produce is called sebum, right? And as you go through your teenage years, right, your glands can get a bit inflamed because they're producing so much oil. And um, that's the best part of pimples. I can't believe I said best part in pimples in the same sentence. The reason we have, uh, we owe our integumentary system so much is it is a barrier. Your skin keeps things out. It's how we make ourselves a closed system. And that's good for our survival. If we didn't do that, right, germs and all sorts of things would invade our bodies. And they, of course they still do that because we give them access points, don't we? Right? We breathe germs in. Um, our eyes are exposed. Uh, germs can get in through cuts and things like that. But we use our skin basically as a barrier and it's a pretty smart one because we regulate our body temperature, right? It protects us from all sorts of things, not just germs that we encounter, but radiation, right? And sometimes we give our skin a hard time. We're out in the, in the UV light too long, right? But it's there literally protecting our DNA from damage from the outside environment, okay? It's our first and foremost line of defense. Your skeletal system is your bone, your cartilage, your ligaments. Now, when it comes to uh, when it comes to your, your various systems, as soon as I go through an overview of this, I want to go out. I've got a really neat animation to show you something that you can use in this course. It'll turn out to be really handy. It's sort of like a virtual anatomy dummy. It's coming up here shortly. So your bones, that's pretty obvious, right? These little calcium carbonate things inside of you, right? We have an endoskeleton, needless to say, right? Insects have an exoskeleton. Now, if you look at cartilage, we're born quite cartilaginous. In fact, the top of our skull, um, when you look at babies, you can see the pulse and you can see the top of the head right here, sort of bouncing up and down because the um, you can see the blood vessels um, surging. Now, when we get older, the bones will seal over and you won't see that anymore. But we are car quite cartilaginous. In particular, you'll see cartilage around the nose, cartilage around the end of the joints. And you, right now you're about 17 years old. And when the end of the joints, when your bones stop growing, the end of the bone becomes, well, bony. It's not as cartilaginous, cartilaginous as it used to be. So your bones reach maximum length. You'll find cartilage here. You'll find cartilage in your sternum. You will find cartilage, find some cartilage down here. And you'll find cartilage or fiber cartilage, special kind of cartilage, that make up the discs or the pads between your vertebra. You'll find cartilage on the ends of, I'll just draw it as a continuous line. You'll find cartilage on the end of your ribs. And that's good because we need, we can't just be bony. We actually have to be fairly cartilaginous because if we're not, it, it becomes really hard to breathe. We need a, we need a flexible skeleton, right? We can't just have a skeleton that's, that's hard because it, it wouldn't accommodate us when we breathe or when we play sports or anything like that. There we go. 
So it's without a skeleton, we wouldn't have our muscles would have nothing to pull on. Right? Without without our muscles, here for example our bicep connected via tendons to our forearm down here, we wouldn't even be able to flex our arms. So there's got to be something to pull on. Now sometimes people get a little confused about ligaments and tendons. So tendons, just so you know, are always muscle connected with bone. Whereas ligaments are bone to bone connections. So I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. There's you'll also find other sort of uh, additional functions of the skeleton. If you've if you studied any uh, any anatomy, you'll know that our long bones in particular have um, what we call the marrow, and it's in here where our red blood cells are born, and our white blood cells are born, and our platelets get their start. So our bones are very important, not just as being structural assistance, but they're also where our the cells of our uh, basically our circulatory system are born. These bones are a huge store of calcium, um, calcium carbonate, things like that. So they're also, well, like storage. So as we get older, right, we'll find that it's a little bit harder for our bones to do that great job of storing like they used to. And they talk about um, disorders like osteoporosis. So our muscular system. Um, really need we divide that into a couple of things. The one that's most obvious what you're looking at here is you're looking at skeletal muscle or skeletal whichever way you'd like to say it and that's of course voluntary but as we pointed out there's some involuntary ones right our involuntary ones are smooth muscle of the digestive system and cardiac muscle Not drawn to scale, of course, I guess, unless you're the Grinch and it's grown three sizes. But anyways, that's your, your cardiac muscle is not under uh, conscious control. And of course, what does muscle do? Muscle contracts. And that contraction is either to move through food through our system, to pump blood throughout our bodies, or in the case of our skeletal muscle, to pull against our bones and in conjunction with ligaments and tendons to give us the ability to move, right? It's a good idea to have this when you're running away from that big cat that's trying to bite onto the back of your deck. Yes, yes, those mountain lions. Okay, so the next system to look at is our circulatory system. And as it states, it does exactly what it says it does. Um, it moves things around the body. A lot of people with the circulatory system maybe not be cluing into the fact that it's circulating very important things, right? Not just oxygen. I mean, we, we understand that oxygen's required for our mitochondria run. We've got to get oxygen in. We've got to get carbon dioxide out. That needs to leave the body. But we also have to have the distribution of nutrients, vitamins, minerals, proteins, carbohydrates, all those things that each one of our cells requires. Additionally, um, you have to circulate things around, like your white blood cells have to get around to your tissues to monitor, to make sure that infection's not happening, right? Distribution of antibodies. We've got to get waste products away from the cell, right? And by waste, I understand carbon dioxide, but we also produce uh, waste like urea. Right, that comes out in our urine. So we have to take um, our blood and send it past the kidneys, right down here, the base of the back. It's not drawn in here. I'm not drawn to scale, but you get the idea. We have to send it off to our kidneys for a little bit of um, processing. That's kind of an important thing to do. So there we go. Animation just caught up. And we need to stay warm. So as we move the fluids around the body it's you can also think of it as a heat pump or distribution of, of well 
not only to, to bring heat around to, around to the whole body, but also to we can send excess heat to our skin and uh, we can release it that way. You might have, you might have seen um, uh, your pets where their ears, you can see that they flush after they've been running. Their ears will be sort of a, a brilliant sort of pink. That's because the capillaries in the ears are um, dilated and your pet is literally letting off heat from its ears. And that's a trick you'll see with um, some interesting critters in the Australian outback. Okay. So the next body system, just again waiting for this to catch up to me, is the respiratory system. I'm just going to see where we're at. So I'm just going to pause this. It's not catching up. Okay, so our respiratory system, um, think back a little bit to biology 11. I, I think perhaps some of the structures of the respiratory system get forgotten. Of course, we've got a couple of air intakes and realize that you breathe through both of these, right? You'll breathe through your nose and your mouth at the same time. The back of the throat is a little region that we call the pharynx. So I'll just denote that with a P. And if you're calling earthworms, it's the pharynx region where they're pulling dirt in madly, right? Now, as we breathe in, we'll go past a little junction here called, um, there's a little sorting junction called your epiglottis, but we'll focus on that later. It directs whether or not um, what's going down your throat goes into your digestive system or whether uh, you're looking at breathing and that you're sending uh, a gas down into your lungs. So we'll head down past the trachea here. Hopefully it catches up with me here. There we go. And the idea, of course, is to bring um, gas from the atmosphere, specifically oxygen, into our lungs, right? Because we want to distribute it uh, to our blood and to all of our cells. Now, conversely, just erase here, we want to send carbon dioxide out from our blood and exchange it with the atmosphere as a waste product of cellular respiration. So what we've done is we've burned um, fuel in the mitochondrion and we need to get the CO2 waste product out. In addition, whenever you burn a hydrocarbon, you also get the production of some water. I think I recall us talking about that in Science 10 and in your various chemistry classes. So this body system uh, is very important for the release of waste products. And yes, water is a waste product. So on a winter day, you'll see uh, the water droplets condensing. All right. So let's just let it adjust there. So of course, if you look at all the structures of the respiratory system, um, nose, pharynx, larynx. Larynx uh, is an interesting one, right? We'll, we'll look at your uh, vocal cords there. Your trachea, if you put your hand on it right now, you can feel the rings, cartilaginous rings in your windpipe. That's what your trachea is. And as you lead down to the lungs, uh, you go through bronchioles, sort of large tubes, until you reach the, the lungs themselves and the lungs are really just an interface with the bloodstream. So we'll be looking at that uh, interface quite closely. And the function, well, more or less, I think we, we stated it. We need oxygen in. We need cellular waste products like carbon dioxide and water out. Good. The digestive system is obviously what brings in nutrients for us to reassemble. So I'll just wait for it to adjust there. And the digestive system uh, includes uh, our mouth, our pharynx. Uh, that's basically the back of the throat, right? What I say to a lot of people as far as the pharynx go, they'll say, I don't understand where the pharynx is. And I'm like, well, if you were running with a straw, heaven forbid, and that straw went to the back of your throat like this, right? That horrible feeling. Those of us have done this. Um, you would be touching the back of 
uh, your mouth, but if you go a little bit further, that's the pharynx. So when you're drinking like something like a like a milkshake, and um, the back of your throat hurts because you're flexing the muscles so much, that is your pharynx. The whole point of your digestive system is to take in nutrients, um, tear them down, and then reassemble them. Your digestive system itself, focus in a little bit here. Um, obviously, you know about your stomach, right? You've got your large intestine here. You've got your small intestine here. So we'll put a few labels here, large intestine. You've got your small intestine and your stomach. Um, they're all distribution highways, but there's some really important uh, accessory organs that we can't forget about, namely uh, your liver. And we'll also be looking at things like your pancreas, which you can't live without, very important digestive organ, right? And we should even consider the waste area, where we have the rectum and leading out to the anus. There's, there's a lot to look at here. So waste elimination is also a part of the digestive system that's often overlooked. There we go. Your excretory system. So when we look at the excretory system, everybody seems to remember the kidneys, right? Two of them. You can literally live with uh, two thirds of a kidney. That's, that's enough kidney tissue to get the job done. And kidney disease is of course a very major problem, but people forget that your skin is also an excretory organ. The, in your sweat, you'll find that you have uh, urea, which is a waste product, right? And it, it's a salt and you'll feel it, it, it will sting your eyes if you're ever uh, exercising that intently, right? Or intensely, yeah, that's urea. We have our ureters leading down to our bladder And we have the urethra leading out. So the whole point of your excretory system is to get waste products out of the body. You can't keep these things in your blood. Um, protein consumption can introduce a very strong base into your bloodstream. And that base needs to be removed. And that's the function of our kidneys. If we didn't do it, our pH would get completely out of whack and that could be fatal. Now the endocrine system is an interesting one. This is all about your hormones and organs that produce the hormones, regulate the hormones and send signals throughout the body. So a couple of famous ones, right? We've got our, you know, about your, you know, about adrenaline, that supercharging Spider-Man like hormone, right? Well, you've got your adrenals, you've got your pancreas, Think of the production of insulin there. Ovaries, estrogen and progesterone. And in males, testes, right, testosterone. Now these are all part of your hormonal system. We study the endocrine system in, in uh, BC Biology 12. We talk about it as we go along, but it's pretty important. If it wasn't for the function of your pituitary gland up here, your thalamus and your hypothalamus, this region right here, without getting into too much detail, um, you wouldn't have sort of hormonal regulation. And that region that I just circled there is responsible for your height, right? the, the secretion of growth hormone that makes your bones lengthen and expand. So it's a pretty important thing, right? You might have heard of your um, uh, thyroid gland, right? And if you think about your thyroid gland, it's pretty important. Your thyroid gland kind of up here, um, without that, your metabolic rate wouldn't be set. It's all important. Okay. The lymphatic system this is a fabulous one. When we get to the circulatory system, I'll go in depth on this more. But your lymphatic system is a parallel highway to your um, cardiovascular system and there are lymphatic capillaries, lymphatic, uh, they look like veins for example and these are really important in returning uh, fluid back to circulation from your tissues. It's also a region where your 
immune systems go to get an education. So I'm going to highlight that. Right? There's little organs down here, for example, like your spleen, right? Like uh, that are a place where, or well, and your thymus are places where your immune systems go to uh, learn how to be better immune system, immune system fighters. Okay, T cells, for example, um, need to uh, learn how to fight infection, and they'll they'll mature in these different organs. But if you remember from grade eleven, we talked a little bit about elephantiasis. So we'll talk about that in this system. What happens when um, these vessels get plugged up? So, but the whole name of the game, all these body systems are all about maintaining homeostasis. And homeo, really, if you think of the word homeo, means same. And you can think of stasis as being state. A good example would be your body temperature. So we're around 97 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about normal for um, grown adult males and females. It'll be a little bit warmer for children. But 97 degrees Fahrenheit, you think about it, our bodies want to maintain that temperature. If we go outside of it, we get a fever. Um, if we go hypothermic, right, our bodies will shiver in response just to bring us back up to that temperature. There's certain st states that our bodies want to be at. So homeostasis is maintaining your internal conditions. Your, um, we want to maintain enough oxygen in the blood. We want to get the carbon dioxide out. We want to maintain nutrients. We've got to keep everything working together. So it's pretty important that our bodies have little feedback loops. And, oops, let's see here. Feedback inhibition. There's a couple of different kind of loops the, uh, that we'll talk about. The first one, um, when we just sort of discuss what homeostasis is, is a negative feedback loop. An easy way to denote this one is if our temperature rises too much. So you've been out exercising and our temperature is getting out of control. Now our bodies will take that data and they'll fight back. So what will we do? Well, we'll sweat. So our sweat glands kick in and it brings our temperature back down. Why? Well, because we're trying to get back to that steady state of about 97 degrees Fahrenheit. I like Fahrenheit a little bit better than Celsius. Uh, the units are smaller. It's, it's just better for human body temperature to, to track it this way. You don't have to use halves of degrees Celsius. That's why I like Fahrenheit more. More whole numbers, easier to track. So when we have feedback loops, in this case, our bodies, when, they've, when they go in the opposite direction, this would be negative feedback. So our, our response is to bring something in the opposite direction. So a fever, for example, um, is kind of an interesting example. Our bodies, sometimes our bodies do heat up, but that's to fight infection. That's, that's for a different reason. But when we're healthy and the temperature rises too much, the negative feedback is just to bring us back down by sweating. Pretty simple stuff. Good example. Uh, this is exactly the same way that your thermostat works. So if we think about ourselves as being uh, as having an internal thermostat, the thermostat like a region in our brain senses our body temperature. If you, if you go into the center of the brain, you go to the, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and right around the pituitary gland, that region will sense and just react to the fact that your body's heating up too much, right? So it will send out a signal to switch off the heat, sort of that click you'll hear in your thermostat, and then you'll sweat and the body temperature decreases. Now that system can switch on, for example, when you're cold, Let's just put sweat here, right? And in this case, if you were too cold, right? You've been out fishing and it's, you've been out in the boat too long and your lips will go a little blue because you're, you're getting kind of cold and you may have a shivering response. So in this case, you want your temperature to go down, but in this case, you want your temperature to go up. 
So if you're too cold, there's an opposite, there's a, there's a response that pushes you in the opposite direction. Shivering will heat you up. But if you're too hot, sweating will bring you down. So that's negative feedback, where the response causes the opposite effect. So homeostasis is, is pretty darn important because it maintains uh, not only sta stable body temperature, but a great number of things. Um, it will maintain your blood pH. It'll keep nutrients flowing to all your cells, right? Your body, your body will literally cannibalize itself. If, if for example, um, you are in an unfortunate situation, say you're starving to death, your body will go after your muscles as a source of protein, just to maintain enough protein in the body to keep you alive. Right? So we know about temperature, just to name a few. And many, many of these instances will come up as we go through this. Okay, so uh, the hypothalamus, in your brain, you've got a region which is very, uh, sort of in the midbrain, and let's look at it now. I'll just want to show you where that is. The hypothalamus There we go. Let's go to images. And there it is. Okay. So this region in the center of your brain uh, has a lot of blood vessels associated with it. And it can sense, um, think of it as tasting the blood, what's going on. Uh, from temperature to pH to carbon dioxide levels to the levels of your hormone. And what it will do is it will tell um, some glands near it, underneath it is the pituitary gland, it will tell those glands to send out certain responses. So this is your brain's sort of automatic coordination center. Oop. So if your blood vessels, um, if your blood vessels are, uh, uh, are constricting because you're cold, that's your body keeping your heat in at your core like in the case of where you may be developing, heaven forbid, hypothermia. Oppositely, let's just put a note here. Okay, so this is to, this is to keep you warm. You don't want to let all that blood to the skin because you'll just, uh, you'll lose heat and you'll get even colder, right? If you look at uh, the shiver response, okay, that's to basically warm you back up. It's that opposite response we just looked at. So that portion of your brain we just looked at called the hypothalamus uh, is pretty smart. It can, it can op act in varying ways just to keep your homeostasis of your body temperature sort of maintained. So that's a, that's a good survival trick. Um, we know what happens if we don't maintain it. it. If you slip into hypothermia, for example, it can cause unconsciousness, ultimately death. If you get too hot, you can get hyperthermia, right? Um, not good. Okay, so this sort of brings us to the, to the end of this. I did state that there was something I wanted to show you as far as these body systems go. This is going to be very instrumental uh, in the course. In fact, uh, you're going to be using it as some of, in some of your project-based learning examples. Okay, uh, right here. So if you go to the web and you just type zygotebody.com, just this portion right here, zygotebody.com, you come to a fabulous sort of free open resource and it's tremendous in a couple of respects. For one, um, you, can you can choose whether or not you want to look at male or female anatomy. And as we go through the course, you can look at the varying body systems. So I just want to do a quick demo of this because it's going to be so instrumental. So if you pull down on this, you can you go past the skin level. And zoom in. <laughs> zoom in. Zoom in. Let's pull that down. There we go. 
This is anatomy. Okay. And you can go to the skeletal level. So here we are at the muscle level. We're going through the bones, right? We're going through the digestive system to the heart. There's lymphatic capillaries and there's to the nervous system. Okay. So what I thought was fabulous about this is if you are, let's say, we're looking at the circulatory system, if we go like this, I'll zoom in. Whoa, there we go. And you can just pull this like this. We look at we can look at the uh, body um, and just the parts that we want. So if you select this, you it's a it's a horizontal slider, and you can turn it off. And what I did there was I turned off the lymphatic system. I don't want to see the nerves right now, so I'm going to turn off that system. And lo and behold, there we go. This is fairly amazing stuff. I'll zoom in. Here's why. You can click around and it'll tell you what the structures are. For example, I am just come out of the aorta of the heart and this is the descending aorta. And as that comes down, you notice kind of what's over here. Um, what's missing, uh, we're going to show off in a second, right, would be your kidneys down in this region. Right? But this allows you to see your blood vessels in a lot of detail. Right? For example, there's your vena cava. And it's a tremendous resource. So if you hold uh, down your mouse button, you can twist this around in different orientations. I think it's pretty neat when you look at just how many blood vessels there are in the head. So this is going to be a very important uh, tool that we're going to use in the course. And again, that's called zygote body. Okay, so that's an introduction to body systems, folks. Thanks for listening, and we're done. Ciao.